Good evening and welcome to another edition of Film Nut. I am your host, Jeff Schubert. Glad you can join us. My guest tonight, Kate Levering, is a Tony Award-nominated actress for her role as Peggy Sawyer in the Broadway revival of 42nd Street, for which she did win the Fred Astaire Award for her dancing. Levering can currently be seen on the Lifetime series Drop Dead Diva, in which she plays attorney Kim Caswell. And in 2010, she'll be starring in a feature film with a great ensemble cast. The film is called Like Dandelion Dust. It'll be coming out sometime in 2010. We look forward to that. And now here she is to talk about that and a little bit of theater is Kate Levering. Hi. How are you, Kate? Good, how are you? Great, great to have you come in. Really I'm appreciate so impressive. It. That intro is so impressive. <laughs> well, you are impressive. <laughs> and, uh, you help me do my job <laughs> just by being who you are. And um, I know we rolled, for those of you who uh, may have just came in before the show, we rolled a little the trailer for Drop Dead Divas in which you have black hair, right? <laughs> No, it's not like black, well, not, not like black. Elvira black. Not Elvira black, no. It's not Halloween <laughs> it's black. It's kind of a ready Auburn, but yeah, the last two roles, both in the movie and in the television series, I'm a brunette, so it feels nice to be back in Southern California and have my, I feel like me again. Your natural dreads? There you go. <laughs> yeah, not quite natural, <laughs> right. but my, my, uh, my color of choice. Your color of choice. There yeah. you go. I'm wrong left and right. No, Halloween black, natural blonde. <laughs> So, for people who may have missed may have missed that trailer, what is Drop Dead Diva about, and who do you play, and what is your character about? Um, ha, this question, this question. Stumped um, you on the first one. <laughs> it is, yeah, I'm stumped on the first one. The interview's over. Um, it is a kind of a combination of Heaven Can Wait meets Ugly Betty meets... Ally McBeal, put it all in a blender. Sure. And that's our show. That's the short version. Okay. Do you want the long version? Well, uh, well the slightly long. So for those of you who haven't seen Heaven Can Wait, we have a situation where in Drop Dead Diva, two people kind of yeah. simultaneously die. Correct. And the spirit of the diva, um, the model, yeah. goes into the body of this attorney who's a little bit on the overweight side. Correct. And she has to now live out her life. Correct. Or, through this different body. Yeah, the setup of like the the setup in the pilot is just what you said. There's like a body um, two women die at the same time, two very opposite different types of women die at the Physically, same time. Physically, mentally, yeah, everything. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. It's kind of a Parasilton esque um, vapid, shallow right. um, wannabe spokesmodel. In right. fact, when she dies, she's on her way um, to an audition for the Price is, White, Price is Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then the attorney. Um, so what happens is they both die at the same time, and the model's soul. She goes to purgatory where she is analyzed. Her deeds are analyzed. She's a zero zero. She's done no good deeds, but no bad deeds. So they don't know where to send her, heaven or hell. She doesn't have time for this, so she hits the return button, and her soul is rerouted into the last vacated body, which is Jane, the sort of down and out attorney, insecure, um, So like the angel, the angel who's checking her in, he's got his little computer. Exactly. And, and she hits exactly. the return button on that. Yeah, exactly. And that's where jetes her into um, Jane's body. Exactly. And so now Jane was a, was an attorney in this law office where, you, where your character Correct. works. Correct. She and tripped over my Hermes handbag and was shot. <laughs> right, there you go. <laughs> Which is true. Wow, okay. I, I, I missed the first episode, so I didn't oh, catch yeah, that Oh, yeah, that's part. it. Okay. So I'm sort of a part of the reason that she was shot in the first place. And now you're stealing her boyfriend, but we'll get to that later. Um, so, yeah, so, she, so that's how she winds up there. Now, she keeps all of her memories as the supermodel. Yeah. And she doesn't have the memories of Jane, but she has the knowledge, or she gets flashes of the knowledge. She has the she brains of Jane. Um, the soul and the memory of Deb. Mm -hmm. So actually what's really interesting, and I think we're, we're, we just start to get into it in the season finale, there's a big twist, and we're, ju we're just realizing that we don't know who Jane was before she died. So Jane is figuring out who this person is, whose body she now inhabits, which is actually, you know, I didn't even really think about it until we got later into season one is that like we have no idea who this girl is she could be anybody we, we get like snippets of it her relationship with her mom in, a, in an episode right recently. last week's episode jane jane's mom just shows up right. and she's like who is this woman right but we can tell a little bit about jane by how she relates by her relationships with her mother and it seems like as in the new version she's trying to aspire 
to do better, yeah. you know, to get to be closer, like in, with the mother, yeah. to be more affectionate, to be more. Well, I think that there are every all of our characters. Um, you know, there are lessons to be learned through Jane. So let's talk about Kim, the villainess, as you have described I her know. On, on the on the website there. Very interesting character because I see a completely different affect in you, the actor, in this character based on whether you're interacting with Jane or Grayson. Or your boss. To me, that speaks a lot to your work as an actress because it's so organic to me. Where, you know, because obviously you have feelings for Grace and yet you work with him, right? So mm -hmm. you get angry at him differently than you can get angry at Jane. Right. So tell me about Kim and how you created her. What was the backstory you gave to her and so forth? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. <laughs> That's uh, a really amazing compliment. Thank you so much, and I I uh, appreciate it. Obviously, I. You know, that's something that we all want is to be subtle and have nuances to our performance. Um, so, yeah, I think that I think that Kim, the way Kim deals with uh, Jane, especially, you know, I I always have to remember that the Jane that Kim is dealing with now is so completely different because she's not Jane anymore. She's Deb. So this new person is challenging her in a way that she was probably never challenged before at the office. Her relationship, her relationship with Jane is wildly different than it is with now Jane Deb. Right. Does that make sense? Absolutely makes perfect sense. So yeah. she's being pushed in a way that, you know, Jane was a pushover. Um, and I think Kim probably just walked all over her. So there's new, there's this new, like, sense of because who Jane, is this person? Because Jane as Deb can relate, has a difference, doesn't have maybe the same self esteem that Jane as Jane had. Correct. You know? In fact, a much higher self esteem right. because she still feels like. The supermodel. Yeah, a supermodel. So it's interesting, yeah. I mean, I see some of the subtleties I was talking about. And again, just to get a little bit more specific, some actors who might be technically based, they'll get angry the same no matter who they're talking to. We, in our lives as people, we get angry at our parents differently mm -hmm. than we do our boyfriends or girlfriends, than we do our work people, and so forth yeah. and so on. So those, those are the subtle nuances I observe in your work that you're really this person that these individual characters are affecting you differently and touching you the way they should and you're reacting to them in their roles as they are in your life. Does that make sense? Yes, and again, thank oh, you. <laughs> I just wanted to be clear to the audience. Yeah, I think, you know, I like get, uh, you know, with a guy I'm dating, of course I get angry differently with him than I would my sister, than I would my boss, than I would my mother, and um, so those are all, you know, nuances that we try to it's a fine line. And, and now I notice you, and I'm kind of, I missed the f first few episodes of the show, I'm kind of glad because it gave me a more objective look at you. And I see like the looks that you shoot Jane once in a while because she's giving you stuff that surprises you because she's not the same person Correct. anymore. Correct, yes. You know, and, and I see that in you. Well, uh, here's the part where I say I can't be so selfish. Let's get to some instant messages from viewers. Cherry would like to say, one, I absolutely love with one, two, three, four, five, Five O's, just so you know. What? <laughs> Love Drop Dead Diva. Will there be a second season? Well, lo and behold, take it away. Yes. What's her name? Sherry? Sherry, yeah. Yes, there will be. We just uh, got Cherry, season Cherry, two. Cherry, I'm sorry. Cherry, we yeah. just got season two. It was just recently, like, just announced in the last couple of days, right? No, we've known for a few weeks. A few weeks? Okay. Yeah, so it's very exciting. And, and what was your reaction? Who told you? Was it your manager? Was it a producer? Was it? Who told, who told me? Uh, we can get back to that one. I don't remember. Okay. I'm sure it was like the. Oh, because. I'm sure my manager. A little party afterwards. You don't yeah, I, I have no idea. <laughs> no I was idea. completely <laughs> drunk. Um, no, I'm sure it was my manager. Okay. Uh, let's see. Dave's would like to ask: Is your work week longer or shorter based on how many scenes you are in a given episode? So, for an episode where you are not in as many scenes, are you not on set as much, or are you sitting around the set longer? Uh, Hurry up and wait. <laughs> great question. Um, yeah, definitely, depending on how many scenes you're in. And we shoot the show in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So we are in a little small town called Peachtree City. Hello, anybody in Peachtree <laughs> City who's watching. Um, the baristas at Starbucks I know so well. Um, uh, yeah, so I actually, I'm always hoping when I get a script that I'm in, that I'm in the episode a lot because downtime in a city where you don't live is a little bit different than downtime here in Los Angeles. So usually, depending on the day, um, on the location, um, it means a shorter work week. 
Sometimes it means like if you're in the first scene of the day and the last scene of the day, that it's a, a hurry up and wait kind of situation. Okay, so. But that's how, you know, that's why we get paid. Sure, so you're right, you're getting paid the same either way, right, whether yeah. they use you or not. So, uh, but there are some where you might work less days than the cycle for an episode? Oh yeah. Where they, they won't make you? Yeah, depending on how many scenes you're in, like if I have a light storyline for that episode, then I may only work two days a week. Which means a lot of time at the pool That's in right. Tree City. <laughs> there you go. And that coffee place, right? And Starbucks, <laughs> And the Starbucks, yeah. right. Now, another aspect of your character that I really like is, um, I guess I want to call it this, like, annoyed sarcasm that you get. <laughs> you know? Is that, is that an... Whatever you're uh, talking about. Is that a fair way? Uh, okay, there was this one episode where um, Marla Sokoloff was the guest star. Mm -hmm. And her fiancé cheats on her with the maid of honor on the day of their wedding, was it at the church? I mean, yeah, I mean it was like I, the, worst, the worst possible scenario. Yeah. So the guy comes to you to say he's sorry, he, he wants to communicate with his fiance and he, she won't return his calls or whatever, and he yeah. says, I know I messed up. And you say something like, you know, messed up is telling her that her ass looks too fat in a dress. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's not like, know. you know. To and then I think the follow-up line is, um, you banged the maid of honor on the wedding day. That's right, or, or during, before the I do's <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah, before the I do's, do's, yeah. You know the script better than I do. So, so you have, like, so many, another one is like, um, you know, this one character refers to lawyers as, like, superheroes, and you're like, well, Wonder Woman has to get back to work now, yes, or something like that. Yes, these are all, I love my one-liners. I, lo I think our writers do a great job, um, especially with me, and I imagine that the writer's room, I imagine it's really fun to, like, come up with these bitchy, one-liners for my character and it's just like it's like a little piece of candy <laughs> every time I get to say it it's just fun who talks like that <laughs> so you enjoy it I now, do it's now it's Kim nice. it's kind of like um, is it fair to say Kim is power hungry oh yeah 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 but that's interesting because that you know brings up why she is that way and especially in the um, Marla Sokolov ep episode you know, her, I think her sarcasm and her, um, what did you say, her annoyed the, sarcasm? The annoyed kind of anger, because you're impatient, you want to get to the, cut to the chase. Yeah, and, and I, but I think also, you know, she has men issues, mm -hmm. and one of the lines in that episode is, and it it's definitely parallels what what's happening with Grayson. Yes. Um, is that, uh, she says, a man has one chance and one chance only to show you who he is or to prove to you who he is. And I think that that really speaks to who she is and, and hints of what has happened in her past. Yes, yes. And that's what's happening in that episode is Kim keeps trying to talk to Grayson about um, the kiss and, um, and he won't talk to her about it. And he won't, you know, there's like, he won't address it. And so she kind of shows her vul vulnerability a couple of times and then after he blows her off, she's like, I'm done. Over, brick wall, guard, guards up. Toe dipped in the pool, didn't go as I wanted, boom, yeah. wall back up. Yeah. So now you talk, uh, we talk a little bit about her, she wants to be a partner in the, in the company mm -hmm. someday, man issues. Did you create your own backstory for this character? What were you told? <laughs> what did you create? And did you collaborate with the producers? How did that go? Um, I thought a lot before the, you know, before we started filming, I thought a lot about her backstory and I had this whole, you know, thing in my mind and I wrote um, the creator, um, writer-creator Josh Berman an email with, you know, my whole, you know, pitch <laughs> and he basically called me and he's like, no, no. And of course he had something much better and much more interesting than my story, which is why I'm the actor who does what I'm told and he's the producer, creator, writer of a hit television show. Well, was there one thing that you put in that you can say that he didn't like? That you? Um, well, I had her just coming from a totally different world. I actually live in Newport Beach, and so I'm surrounded by, uh, I don't want to, um, I'm surrounded by, you know, a, at times a certain type of of well, person or women, no, 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 exactly. And so I had her, I had her kind like of coming from this like elite right. world and this, you know, totally different place. Whereas he has her coming from a place of she grew up with nothing, and it's part of why, um, and she's really shameful of that, and she has a lot to hide. She doesn't want anybody to know that she came from this 
really kind of low um, place in life. And that to me is so much more interesting than like you're the b bitchy little right. beach bunny from right. Laguna or right. whatever. Right. You're like from the hills. Right. Yeah, I got to agree with you. Yeah, I agree exactly. With him. Yeah. <laughs> that works really Which well. Which is why I'm an actor and he's, you know, who he is. Let's see. Bottom would like to ask the obvious question. Let's see if this is obvious to you. If you woke up tomorrow in the body of another famous person, who oh, would it be? Lord. Have you been asked that one before? I have. You have? I have. Okay. I've, well, I've been asked also uh, if I were reincarnated, who would I, you know, right. come back as? And that's super easy because that's my dog. My dog, right. like, lives the best life ever, and he comes to set every day, and <laughs> right. he has a swimming pool right. next to my trailer, right. and he flies, you know, yeah. with me in the, in right. the plane. So. <laughs> I haven't thought about a person to ask me again. Okay. Uh, no one comes <laughs> Let me to think about it for okay. a second. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Pies would like to ask, what, what do you think about Hollywood catching up with everyday people who are not a size zero and portraying them in a positive way? Um, Pies, that's so hard to take you seriously because your <laughs> name is Pies. Um, <laughs> no, but that's a great, great, great question. And I think that that's part of the beauty of our show is that um, we're creating a dialogue, um, whether it's our court cases that deal with women's issues, um, you know, eating disorders or weight discrimination, which is all over our show and all over, uh, you know, the, the this industry and you know, life or um, sexual harassment, you know, and I think that that's one of the, you know, nobody's really doing that right now. They're a little bit in Ugly Betty and. Um, and I love that. I think that's the first step in solving problems and and healing. Um, and you know, we get letters that say mothers are talking to their daughters for the first times about these things, and sisters and girlfriends. And so I think it's um, I'm really happy about it. I think it's a I struggle with it in Hollywood. You know, it's like this sick, warped sense of the way people should look and how they, you know, how the world views you. Do you feel extra pressure on that because you're oh. an actress? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah. I have my struggles. I, my weight fluctuates, um, you know, I have my own issues with it. And it's definitely harder, not harder, but it's different when you're on television and, you know, you have a different kind of pressure than, than real life. Well, you know, the great question, by the way, and, and you hit on it in your answer, the different types of cases that you guys do on your show versus maybe other legal shows. Yeah. I think you tackle them in a way that's uh, creative, new, new and different. It's fun. I mean, this is a dramedy. Every episode I've watched makes me laugh and also makes me think. And, you know, sometimes, you know, okay. get a little emotional. I'll admit it. I know I'm a guy. But, you and know. you're a dude. You're <laughs> not even our key demographic. That's right. So the women must be, like, weeping into their hankies. Right, because obviously there's no <laughs> pressure on me with, you know, the pressure on me is to gain weight. Now, you know, not to, um, <laughs> not, not the other way around. So that, is, it, is it more fun for you to, when you as an actress are advocating points of view that you agree with? Like, you're playing this character in the show as compared to like maybe hard when you have to do scenes where you're saying stuff that you don't believe in personally? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, you know, like anything in life, if you believe in something, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just much, much easier. Um, you know, if you believe in something, then you speak to it in a way that is truth and kind of a natural in, passion yeah, to it. Yeah. You know? Whereas then, you know, you have some scenes with Jane where you're the one kind of for the purposes of the show, being the villain, hammering at, away at some of those negative stereotypes. But, you know, someone has to do it. Yeah. You know? Well, I've actually, I've been lucky because a lot of my court cases are really fun. I have, like, the dog cloning right. court case or the... Psychics, right. Yeah, the sister psychics or the, you know, the, the business owner whose chocolate bar has been defamed because somebody discovered it had insect particles right, right. in it. You know, good, it's like yeah. this, which I think is really fun because I'm actually not a huge fan of law shows mm -hmm. because of the courtroom stuff. I just lose interest, but not on my show. That's right. <laughs> Dog cloning keeps my interest. Dog cloning keeps her interest. <laughs> Topically relevant. Uh, Boy would like to ask, do you see yourself returning to Broadway? So I, I mentioned in the intro, you are a winner of the Fred Astaire 
award for dancing, Tony nominated. And we know in LA, someone, an actor or an actress does something once, they put it on their resume under special skills, but <laughs> you are like a real dancer, Fred Astaire winner. I am. I would love to go back to Broadway. I am dying, dying to go back. I don't know how my body will handle it. <laughs> Because I moved to New York when I was 18, and um, and really just kind of uh, my body took a beating for sure. Um, well, you can go back to Broadway and not dance, right? I could, yeah. <laughs> right. Then I would have to be a serious actress. <laughs> I don't know about I don't know if that's fun. No, it is. Well, um, tell them what Jeff said about your acting in the film that interview, and <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and they'll cast you. Exactly. No, I would love to go back to Broadway. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, we have a. Um, we're hoping to do something very soon, so I hope that happens. Well, if you can go back to Broadway, is there any play in particular that you would like to, or a role you'd like to play? Or would you do something <laughs> new and original? Or um, I would do something new and original for sure. Um, the, the problem is that, you know, now that the show's coming back, I have a limited window of time, but um, I would love to jump into Chicago. That's, you know, either one of those roles or roles that I, that was actually my first show at 18 years old. I did the, um, the national tour of Chicago right when it was, you know, the big, it was like the splash, the new thing on Broadway. And, um, and so, you know, I would love to do either one of those roles. All right. We will see you in Chicago sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can feel this. The show Chicago. The show Chicago. Right. That's right. We'll see you in Chicago. That would be a big deal, right? <laughs> well, we may see each other <laughs> right. in Chicago, right. but we'll just wave. That's right. <laughs> A uh, website guy would like to ask, how did you prepare to play a lawyer, and can you see yourself ever being one? <laughs> well, I know you have a background in legal acting from <laughs> Kevin Hill, right? That's true, actually. <laughs> um, no, I could never see myself ever being a lawyer. I think that it's, I think that it's uh, a lot more tedious in real life than it is, um, you know, playing one on television. I don't know if you get the dog cloning cases uh, right. in real life. Um, but I actually, the last television series I did was also a law show. It's called Kevin Hill. And so I had a lot of practice, um, you know, in courtroom dramas mm -hmm. doing that. And then also recently spent a lot of time, before I knew the television show was picked up, um, I had family members who were involved in um, a court case. And I spent about a month every day in a courtroom. So that was really good research for me. Now it's by chance. Normally, though, do you like to do research for a role? Would you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And this just worked out that it was kind of perfect. You know, they're supporting the family and doing research at the same time. Now, interesting. We were we were talking before we came on. Um, two of the main projects we're going to be talking about tonight: Drop Dead Diva and also your film. Interesting ways in which you came upon these roles. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's yeah. very true. Uh, <clears throat> I jumped in at the last minute for, for both. Um, it just so happened that um, I'm the last minute girl. <laughs> I'm like the save the day girl, which feels nice because then you show up and everybody's like excited that right. you're there and they're like, oh, thank God you're here. Right. You know, we had no idea what was going to happen. Right. So um, that actually is really nice. Um, but the, the film in particular, uh, they lost the, the leading actress, and so I had about 36 hours to prepare for that role. I got on a plane and scoured over the script, and luckily um, Cole Hauser, who plays my husband in the film, and I were really good friends. We had worked together before, um, and that was really challenging. Just to pick it up Very like that? Very rewarding. And yeah, because it was such an emotionally heavy, heavy um, script and, and role. Um, so it was interesting. So for the audience then, what's Like Dandelion about, Like Dandelion Dust? Like Dandelion Dust is, um, it's about families and it's about a boy who is stuck in a very adult world, an adult situation. Um, and ultimately I play the, the adoptive mother, Cole and I play the adoptive parents of this boy. And Mira Sorvino and Barry Pepper play the biological parents. And there is a, a loophole in the adoption. And seven years after we've adopted him, they come back to try to take him away from us. Yeah, because um, Mira Sorvino, that couple, the other couple, they're kind of like 
uh, low rent. Yeah, very <laughs> down and out. Very down and out, and the husband uh, comes out of prison. Yeah, he's been in jail for domestic violence and, you know. Didn't even know he had a kid. Yeah. Mira signed the abortion papers without him, so the technicality is that he didn't sign it. Correct. So there was who, a forgery. So, for, so who's going to get to keep the kid? Yeah. Now, as I was saying to you before we came on, and I mean fully, I mean, it's, it's a very well-written script. It's great, but I think what keeps it from being like a, a movie of the week versus a feature that you guys should all go out and see is the incredible performances by everyone in the cast. Thank you. Yeah, it's a deep, deep, I mean, it's, it's a great, great piece, wonderful performance. Thank you. Now, so 36 hours, so you, you were you're talking about that, but also there's like this really big emotional scene at the end of the movie that we definitely will not give away, <laughs> but that's a good story, how, that, how you had to work and prepare for that. Yeah, uh, Mira Sorvino and I only have one scene together in the whole movie because it's really shot as these two kind of separate films and then they intersect and it was shot that way as well they shot all of Mira and Barry's stuff um, you know first and then they shot um, well they shot a, a few scenes in the middle but then they shot all of our stuff and then we kind of all intersected at the end um, and that last scene with Mira um, the director John Gunn who's incredible um, I hope he's watching John are you out there um, he kept us apart um, we had never met, and he didn't want us to meet in hair and makeup. And so literally the first time me, my first feature film, um, the first time I ever saw, basically, Mira Sorvino is when she walks into the room, and it's these two mothers meeting for the first time, the biological and the adoptive mother. And as people, it was me meeting Mira Sorvino, this Oscar-winning right. actress, <laughs> right. for the first time. Right. And so a lot of what I needed to get me through the scene was just already there. Right. Because of the way he, um, you know, arranged the day, really. Well, the ironic thing is, is I had a conversation with Mira, and she was like, I was working with this Fred Astaire winning yeah, actor. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> She's a dancer, too. There you go. Very nice. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, you were working with the child. And another great thing about this movie is it didn't set up like a cliche where, like, it's obvious who you're rooting for and who you're not rooting yeah. for. Um, all good people, all wanting the best interest of the child, and then watching how it's going to play out. And I think that, that added to the suspense because you didn't know who you were rooting for. Right. You know, because they all love the kid. Yeah, and there are no winners. And... Um and I, th I think that that's also a testament to um, to John playing against stereotypes because it would be so easy to just say, "Oh, he's an alcoholic and he's an abuser and he, you know, the kid shouldn't go to this family." But yeah. it's really it doesn't come off that way. No. I mean, the audience really it's heart wrenching to try to negotiate where this, who this kid should be with. Yes, because he's trying to reform himself as soon as he's out of prison and, yeah. and do the right thing and do right by his wife and his kid. Yeah. Let's see. In this film, you play the mother of the boy who is traumatized. How could you look at yourself at the end of the day after making that little boy <laughs> cry? John Gunn. <laughs> Apparently he is you watching. You are out there. <laughs> you are. That's and a really mean question, by the way. I'm not the one who made him cry. Yeah. John Gunn is. Um, how could I look at myself at the end of the day? That's cruel. I just see in the, on the top here, Jeff, read username after. And I'm like <laughs> reading this question, I'm like this is kind of a cruel question. You know? <laughs> oh, okay, John, how you doing? Thanks for watching, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I just called you a genius, so you should not have written that meme question. That's right. <laughs> um, you're not a genius anymore. Um, but you were telling me the kid was fantastic, right? He's so good. He's. He's like a little pro. Like we would do these, um, like really emotional scenes where we're both sobbing, and and the little boy is in hysterics. And I'm thinking, good lord, this child is going to need so much therapy after this <laughs> film. Right. Like this poor thing. <laughs> and afterward, I would I would need comfort. I would want to like go to him and say, Are you okay? Do you need anything? And he would just like look at me and be like, Yeah, I'm going to go play baseball with my brother. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> what about me? <laughs> and that was, what about uh, what I need? That was Maxwell Cotton played that Maxwell role? Perry Cotton, Perry yeah. Cotton, very good. Didn't know the Perry. He's on a little show called Brothers and Sisters. Oh, very nice. He's from a showbiz fam. His brother Mason 
is on Desperate Housewives. Oh, great. So, yeah. Well, while we got John's attention, um, why don't we talk about him, make fun of him a little bit, see if we Let's can do it. give you an opportunity Let's to get back to him. Let's do it, John Gunn. Let's see. No, I, one of the things Carrie David said, producer on the film, mm -hmm. when she was on film that way, she talked that... She's sweet and a much better producer than John Gunn. There you go. Much easier to work with. <laughs> you opened up, she's going to open up a can of whoop ass on you now. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, she, she mentioned that John liked to do a lot of improv with you guys. Yeah. Do you recall that? Any scenes in particular? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I'm, I was always really terrified of improv. It's a very vulnerable kind of uh, make yourself look like an ass place to be in. Um, <clears throat> and so I was really nervous about it, and I hadn't really done it very much before shied away from it but you know it helped so much in like creating the underbelly of the scene and sometimes we would improv before a scene and not improv during the scene we would improv like what happened right before the scene started um, but in particular I think working with um, a young child Max was seven when we shot this you know anytime you give them something scripted to say, it kind of comes out in this very scripted, I am a child actor kind of way. And Max is much better than that. He's not what I did. But it, it <laughs> helped. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> I am a child actor. <laughs> a weird robot kid. He was not like that. Um, but it helps because, you know, we could almost like improv him into the scene and get him to say his lines in a more organic, natural way. And John, even though I really dislike him right now, <laughs> um, he had a great way of sneaking the camera in, almost. Mm -hmm. um, he would tail slate a lot so that it wasn't this big production, uh, you know, to start the scene. And we didn't all feel this pressure. So we could kind of improv our way into a scene. He wasn't standing next to you with a bullhorn yelling yeah, action. You know? Yeah, and then <laughs> he would kind of sneak the camera in, which you know, when you see the movie, it's this very raw, you know, cool, it's shot in a really cool way. Well, I really like the, the idea of, okay, so let's say you want to stick to the script, the written word, but even just improv as a way of warming up the muscles yeah. and getting into it. That's that sounds We did great. a lot of warm-up improv, especially getting into the really emotional work. Great. Tail slate is when you shoot right away and clap the slate at the end for speed. Tail Thank slate you very is when you shoot. You getting that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, and it's John Gunn again. And it's okay. Very good. Right? Yes, it is John. John, Gunn again. shut up! This is my interview. That, that was that was me, guys. There's oh. some people in the chat room going, "What is tail slate?" And so we like to explain what I those things are. I thought it was John are. Gunn. I was gonna be like, "Get out of my life! Get out, Get out of my world!" <laughs> Unless there's a sequel, and then call me all you want. <laughs> now, one last question I want to ask you about improv. Now that you've worked your way through it, do you feel like improv helps actors form like? chemistry yeah uh, yeah I, I definitely because again you're 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 that much more dependent on listening because you have no idea what's coming yeah so when you're doing improv right you're, you're right in there yeah with the person and you're just reacting yeah let's see let's get to a non John Gunn related <laughs> <laughs> instant message Bottom would like to ask you are trained as a dancer and have been nominated for a Tony for 42nd Street for it but the roles you've taken don't require any dancing. Do you still dance? And do you consider yourself more of an actress or a dancer? Oh, it's so funny. So free associate. Kate Levering, are you a dancer or an actor? Dancer. There you go. <laughs> but that's, but that, I feel like that's a trap because then I, you know, it's, and, and you know, in, in New York, it's like, are you a singer or are you a dancer? And I would be like, dancer, I'm a dancer. <laughs> I thought you were talking. You know, <laughs> but, but, it's, but I think that that's a trap. So now it's, you know, I have, I hope that now I can say I'm an actor. I hope other people can say that too. Uh, you definitely can. And I think Even though I haven't danced in like <laughs> a while. I, I think the answer is you're an artist. And that, and that encompasses, yeah. right, the dance and acting. So you haven't danced in a while. Would you, right. would you actively seek it? Or is this the sort of thing where if it comes up, it's something you do and it will give you a better chance of getting a part or will you actively seek it? Like continue to train? Or, act, or just roles that involve dancing? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I definitely would. You know, it's hard because in television and film, when does that opportunity right. really come up? I mean, luckily, two of the producers of Drop Dead Diva um, 
Neil Marin and Craig Zaden, they're doing all these, they brought the movie musical back. I mean, they did Chicago and Hairspray. They're doing um, uh, the baseball one. Anyway, they're doing Footloose. You know, they're, the, they're really kind of bringing it back. And, um, but there's not very many opportunities in television and film to dance. Well, I just had an idea right off the top of my head. Now, we know Drop Dead Diva was picked up for a second season. Mm -hmm. And in a recent episode, they did like a dream sequence thing with Paul Abdul, right? Yep. I think there should be another dream sequence thing where you're like just tap dancing your little heart out. I think it may happen. It really? I think that there is a possibility that there could be a, another dream sequence where I dance with Paul Abdul. <laughs> Very cool. I'm putting it out <laughs> You're there. You're putting it out there. So uh, let's see, okay, Chicago. Well, you don't want to put out too much. Right. You know? <laughs> Chicago and a dance thing. Well, let's try, we'll have to take <laughs> well, one off the, the table. Well, that's part of the TV series, so. Right, right, there you go, part of the TV series. El Nan would like to ask, what do you like to do in your free time? What do I like to do in my free time? Uh, I spend a lot of time in Sacramento with my um, family and niece and nephew. Um, and I'm around with my dog a lot. I, I live in, like I said, I live in Newport Beach, so there's a lot of like outdoor, outdoor um, you know, activities. So from Sacramento, why did you make the decision to go to New York and do Broadway first as compared to staying in California and maybe pursuing film and television? Um, that was just kind of a natural, it was the natural progression, uh, like next step for me. I was working at a professional theater in um, Sacramento where I grew up um, all through junior high and high school and singing and dancing and really acting in television and film wasn't even on my radar. I was just a, a musical theater girl and most of my best friends went to college to major in theater and I, I was not, college was not really my path. I kind of like this school of hard knocks girl and so I just moved to New York at 18 it was the natural to audition for Chicago okay yeah specifically so college not your thing law school definitely out right? yeah no <laughs> so then what brought you back to LA then you were in New York very successful mm hmm I was in New York for eight years did six I think six Broadway shows in that time and then I was in um, Toronto shooting Kevin Hill we shot that in Canada um, and when that series was canceled again it was um, natural next step was to come Correct. to LA. Okay. The true answer is I kind of came here chasing a guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gets back to that again, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Man issues, let's Man. not go there. So, so, okay, so how much do Kim and uh, Kate yeah. have in common? Uh, <laughs> they both need therapy. They both need no. therapy. <laughs> now, but Molly is such a different character. Yeah. You know, for like, that's the name of your character in like Dandelion. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't recognize you don't see any of, you know. Yeah, camera. well, I, you know, she's, it's interesting because I think in the book, like Dandelion Dust is based on a, a best-selling best yeah. novel by Karen Kingsbury. Um, and I think in the book, Molly is actually um, an ex-actor. I'm pretty sure. John Gunn will probably write in and That's be like, right. no, you're wrong. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are, you know, some similarities in the fact that, um, that she kind of lives this more uh, elite life. You know, she and Kim are kind of care about care about the same things in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when Molly loses, feels like she's losing Joey, the son, it definitely causes issues in her relationship, you know, in her marriage. When, some, when something falls apart like that, you know, how can it not? All right, she wants your um, husband to do everything. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's that crazy yeah. scene, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in, in most other ways, they're very different. Right. <laughs> Let's see. Well, you were right. Uh, she wasn't an actor in the book. We created that for the script, says John Gunn. <laughs> really? Yeah, really. It's like that. Get out of my world. <laughs> Spray would like to ask, do you think you have any shot at ending up with Grayson, or do you think it's inevitable that he ends up with Jane since she is the quote-unquote hero of the show? So Grayson is, is another lawyer who works in the law firm with you and Jane. Mm -hmm. Right now he is your love interest, and him and Deb were together before Deb died and went, soul went into Jane's body. 
Correct. That's I know it's very confusing. That's right. Did um, I get it right? Yeah. You did get okay, it right. Good. Yeah. Um, Grayson is uh, Grayson is Deb, so spokesmodel Dead Deb. Right. Um, her fiance, and Grayson comes to work at our law office. So Jane, Jane Deb, right. Jane Dead Deb, um, is forced to work with her fiance, and while he's grieving and healing, he kind of. Um, I wouldn't say falls for Kim because I think that that's yet to come. Mm -hmm. um, so they're kind of getting, trying to get together. Um, and will they end up together? I don't know. Obviously, it's a TV show, so I'm sure that the, keeping the tension between Grayson and Jane is really important. Mm -hmm. um, if they got back together, there wouldn't be a TV show, I don't think. Right. Yeah, those things, if they happen, they happen at the very end. Exactly. It, it, you know, it will get strung out. Yeah. But it'll be interesting it'll to... It'll be a good love, love triangle for a while, though. And it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, what the fans want. Yeah. Because I'm sure that'll have some influence. Yeah, I would think. Let's see. Weber. Kate has a very soothing voice. Ooh. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's more of a sex operator voice. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you went from soothing Thank to... You. You know. Glad it's not like an annoying voice or anything. Sane, in TV, supposedly the creative vision is with their producers and film, the director, who runs the show creatively in theater. Uh, the director. The director? Yeah, director, choreographer, yeah. Now, how would you compare working in theater acting versus film? Do you like one better than the other, or are they just different? Now, I like them much differently. Um, I like them both, but much differently. Um, when I started, first started doing um, television and film, it was a very disjointed, sort of jerky process for me because, you know, you're all over the place. Like one day you're shooting the end of the episode, the next day you're in the middle, you know, the next day you're somewhere else, and there's not this sense of completion like there is in theater. In theater. You, every night you start at the beginning, there's a beginning, a middle, an end. You go on this kind of emotional journey, and it all is kind of wrapped up with a nice little bow at the end of the night. So you feel like you've done something, a sense of fulfillment. Um, and in, in television and film, a lot of times it's just so, like, all over the place that at the end, I'm like, I don't even know what the hell I just did. Did I? Did I just do anything? Like, right. Did I just do anything good? And then the, the, the satisfaction comes um, in seeing the finished product. Yeah, I would say like for maybe for non-actors, doing theater is like driving on the Autobahn where you can really open it up and let it rip. Yeah. And doing film or TV is like driving in traffic in New York. <laughs> you know, yeah. start, start and stop. Yeah. You know, it's like you, you rev it if, if the scene calls for it emotionally, but then there's like a cut. You know, or three lines later to change the camera direction. Yeah, it can be very, um, very abrupt. You know, the process is very, you, ha you have to learn, it's a different kind of like, uh, you really have to create the, the momentum within yourself. Because or else you just like, it's exhausting. Whereas theater, you get on the ride and the ride takes you. So it's just, it's very different. Now, anything we can expect coming up towards the end? Any uh, spoilers you're allowed to give away or in the uh, in Drop Dead Drop Diva? Dead Diva. Uh, let's see, where are we? I think we're at ten. I think we have two episodes left. Didn't I eleven just air? I don't think so. Okay. I think we have two more. You could be right. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> well, I the, the, the the episode where uh, Jane meets her mother, I think was right. was the one that just aired. I think there's two more. Two more. Okay. I think. Um, there's a huge twist, big bomb dropped big bomb. in the finale. In the, wow! Yeah. yeah, and you you probably don't have any idea about season two because they just picked it up, so mm -mm. no idea where that's going to go. No. Now that day you were talking about where you work with Mira Sorvino, would you call that your most challenging day on like Dandelion, or was there another day for you that was particularly challenging? Uh, the first day I showed up was challenging because again I was taking over, uh, you know, and and felt a, a certain amount of pressure. I didn't want to let anybody down. I didn't want to show up and have everybody, you know, or anybody think like, what the hell is right. she doing here? Right. Why did they get her? You right. know? Right. Like, <laughs> what was Cole Hauser right. thinking? Right. Um, so that was really challenging. Um, and the, the emotional stuff with, with the boy and with Mira Sorvino was, um, 
really, really hard days, but so much learning, like just acting with her for 13 hours. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. William B., I believe our last I am for the night, would like to ask you, actually William wants to ask me to ask you about your trip to India and your discovery of working with challenging conditions of poverty and illiteracy in the world, acting as a diplomat and goodwill spokesperson. Wow. <laughs> William B., I think I know who you are. Um, I, I went to, last, last December I went to India and um, volunteered for a month and a half um, just kind of stripped down to the bare minimum, not clothing wise. Right. You know. <laughs> um, but just, you know, stripped everything away and I'd never traveled in that way before. So, you know, showered out of a bucket every day for a month and went and taught um, the sons and daughters of the local fisher fishermen in Goa, India, and just had you know, an amazing, life-changing experience uh, Taught there. them survival skills? No, no, just taught them. They taught me more than I taught them. Uh, but we were just, it was, it was, a, it was um, an, 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 like a non-government um, sort of, they would come, they would walk up over the sand dune every day. The school was right on the sand. We just taught like preschool. Oh, okay. Colors, numbers, songs. Um, you know, and we had kids that were anywhere from one to like six years old. So, and you did this for the experience or for? Yeah, just wanted. I mean, I just wanted, just wanted to go help. and do something totally different and do hands-on work as opposed to just like a, attending a charity event. Um, you know, really like roll your sleeves up and get in there. Well, yes, you can, Kate Lemmer. <laughs> <laughs> so, last question for you. We like to get people out here on this one. Is do you have a favorite set term speak? <laughs> Like back to I one? I like a or? couple. I like okay. a couple. Um, I like, um, I like rolling, quiet, please. Okay. I like that, but my favorite uh -huh. is um, cut, prank, check. Because you're done. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that nice. means you got your shot, you're moving on. Well, Drop Dead Diva is on Sunday nights, I believe, 9 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm, on Lifetime. On Lifetime. Yeah. And also, you can watch the last four episodes on the Lifetime website. I think yeah. mylifetime.com. Mylifetime.com. They usually have three or four episodes up on there. And like Dandelion Dust, I know there's a website for that. Um, I think it's, you can just Google like Dandelion Dust, but I think it's blogs. Blogs. There's something with Blogspot. Okay, yeah, just Google that, and we're hoping it comes out in March, I believe. I believe so. I hope so. And we're hoping that I don't see you in Chicago, the city, but in Chicago, the play, yeah. at some point soon. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on. It's been a thank delight talking to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Real pleasure. That is going to do it for this edition of Film Nut. Look forward to seeing you next time on Film Nut 100. Wow. 200 Thank you.